to Outlaw Gamer Radio, the official podcast of OutlawGamers.com. This is the show where we live to play and play to live. I'm Brent Adams, joined by a man who has his own list of things to do in Mad Max, but thankfully only one of them involves getting naked and lathered up in brake fluid. Mr. Lord Bob Garden, Lauren! <laughs> What's up, Brent Adams? What's going on? How's that? Is, how, that is, how's, how's that, uh, that retirement-themed oh. brake fluid wrestling bar plan working out anyway? That is uh, not only one of the more disturbing intros, mm. but it's actually... I'll concede that. So I'm... I'm and I, people are going to... There's people out there that are going <laughs> to just, just facepalm when I say this. Yes. But it is the night before the release of Phantom Pain... And the night before the release of Mad Max. Yes. And I am squarely on the fence between the two. <laughs> uh, I'm yes, buying one of them. There's those from both camps that hate you now. Yes, that's right. And uh, you just talking about Mad Max has made me want to get Mad Max now. I, I, I'm in the same boat. I want both. And I don't know. Uh, it, like, it's not necessarily that I, cu- I couldn't afford both. Like, I could, I could probably swing both games if I, if, I really, if I really wanted to. But it's just the, it's that combination of buying two games right now when I'm still in the middle of trying to finish the Witcher three and, and what do I do? And I, I, I really feel good about both of those games, Mad Max and Phantom pain. I am going to wait and see what, what reviews are like post release and just see what some of the user feedback and everything is from, from, you know, just people playing the games out in the real world. But I'm right there with you. I really, really want both of those. And I'm not sure, I guess, I guess I'm not sure which one I'm going to get first is is ultimately what i'm saying because i have a strong feeling that i'm going to end up getting both of them sooner or later eventually i would i would imagine i think eventually we will get them both but you never know no you don't uh here's one thing i do know eventually you and i are going to get uncharted 4 and uh, yes as a matter of fact Brent, i'm going to go on a limb and i could probably tell you the exact day no way how would you how would you know that <laughs> the, the day as Daniel that i'm going to be getting said. uncharted 4 I can uh, tell you, Brent, because now we know. That's right. We have a release date, which is March 18th, 2016, on the PlayStation 4, and I guess that there's not really a lot else to know about it. There are some, there are some collector's edition. There's some, there's some extra stuff you can get if you want to pre-order. They have, uh, they have a variety of pre-order offerings for you. They've got the uh, Uncharted 4 Thief's Sin. Libertalia Collector's Edition that's going to come with a premium collectible treatment and inside look at the Naughty Dog development process. So with this Thieves in Blu-ray disc, you get a collectible steel book case, and you get a 48-page hardcover art book, you get a Pirate Sigil sticker sheet, and you get a stack of in-game currency to unlock various multiplayer content. Then if you want to step up... Now, okay, now, and, and I should I should specify, that's the special yes. edition. For the low, low price. For the low, low price of $100, or excuse me, no, no, $80. $80 yeah. US, yeah. $100 Canadian. If you want to step up to the Libertalia Collector's Edition, which I just mentioned, that's going to run $120 US. You get everything I just mentioned, plus a 12-inch premium Nathan Drake statue by Gentle Giant. Three multiplayer outfits, two custom weapon skins. You get a Henry Avery sigil ball cap and a Madagascar sidekick out or set of Madagascar sidekick outfits. Um, and then there's actually also a digital deluxe version. If you wanna, if you wanna get that, it's gonna be eighty dollars. You don't get a physical copy of the game, but you do get, uh, you get uh, future access to the first ever single player story add on for the Uncharted series. You get two multiplayer packs, and you get uh, you get an unlock for uh, for two multiplayer customization items. If you want to go with the uh, Uncharted Four Thieves in Digital Deluxe Edition, I have to tell you that uh, I had really forgotten from the Epic Battle Cry days how much I hate detailing fucking pre-order special edition tiers and everything. I, yeah, I, you, I, and I, I you and no, I talked about this leading I have up no to the show. For it. You and I talked about this leading up to the show, and you're like, oh, this news just came out today. And we were like, well, put it on the docket. It'll be a quick thing. We won't need to talk yeah. very long about we'll it. We'll just say the release date and move on. And so I'm going to just say the release date and move on. It comes out March 18th, and if you want to get special shit with it, you can. 
Uh, but I'm already tired of talking about it. Why don't you That's take, exactly right. Why don't you take the next one? <laughs> All right, the next one is also today we got another release date, Brent, for a game uh, that you're very excited about, as yeah. am I, Deus yeah. Ex Mankind Divided. Uh, launches on uh, February 23rd, so just a few weeks before um, Uncharted 4. Now, the article, article we're going to link to, I should tell people, is to the PlayStation blog, and it's about the PS4 announcement, but it's all the platforms. I just, I couldn't, I, I, IGN's article about this was the most annoying article ever. So I just went out and found a less annoying article, but it is coming out on all platforms on February 23rd. Nice. Uh, it also announced... Uh, collector's editions, which include a nine-inch Adam Jensen figure. I'm not going into everything. Listen, uh, the way I, I you don't want to. I don't want to say anything like really. Like I don't want to beat up on these guys too much, but I'm just saying the Nathan Drake figure is 12 inches. That's all I'm saying. Okay, <laughs> that's all. I'm saying. That's right. Adam Jensen's only got nine inches. I mean, really. <laughs> um, I'm so the, put, uh, the title of this fucking episode is going to be Nathan Drake <laughs> is 12 inches. Oh, I thought it was going to be Adam Jensen only has nine inches. <laughs> um, Either so one the of other, those works really well. The other thing about this is uh, they're doing this thing that you know again with the pre-order shenanigans. The Deus Ex uh, Mankind Divided Augment Your Pre-Order Bullshit, which is like they have tiers now, and the more people that buy the game, there's five tiers, and you get things. Like if enough people pre-order, everyone gets an extra in-game mission, and if enough people pre-order all the way to tier five, they're going to release the game four days early. Wow. That's great. Just, I, I, that, that, that's, uh, that, that's awesome. That's really compelling. I'm, I, I'm not pre-ordering this game. I'm not encouraging anyone to pre-order this game, and they can fuck themselves for trying to do otherwise. Oh, my God. I'm just so sick of this crap. So with that, Brent, let's too. move on. But that's coming out on February 23rd. All right. Um, something Ooh, else next that one might not very good. well be coming out. In the February March time between frame. February twenty third and March eighteenth, somewhere in there, we could very well be seeing XCOM two because we sure as fuck aren't seeing it this year. Uh, as, yeah, as many of you know, and many of you informed me, uh, and to our universal dismay, XCOM two has been pushed back. It is no longer going to be releasing late this year, as we first were told. Uh, but it will now be coming out. February fifth, two thousand sixteen. Oh, I, I I misread that for some reason. I thought it was I thought it was between Deus Ex and uh, Uncharted, but it's actually uh, going to preempt both of them. February fifth, two thousand and sixteen. Fraxis's follow up to the amazing XCOM Enemy Unknown I've will be uh, will be hitting the streets. Uh, of course, uh, XCOM Two is the best game ever, and science agrees on that. You can't disagree with science. Uh, there are certain things that we know. We know the Higgs boson exists. We know dark matter and dark energy exist, though we don't understand their nature. And we know XCOM 2 is the greatest game ever. So, end <laughs> of discussion. No, I'm kidding. Yes, uh, my, my condolences to you and yours, Brent. I know this is uh, <laughs> that's right. This is deeply troubling news. For uh, And again, I missed There the shall be original. no comfort under my roof until <laughs> this game right. comes out. Uh, but but I'm not that far off, and it's not like we don't have games coming between now and then. No, honestly, it, were it not for the fact that we were just talking about the problem we have of having too many amazing games to play right now, I might be more upset. But I can't quite bring myself to uh, to get upset about this because I've got plenty to keep me busy from now until then. Although, if you do find yourself in that in that position of just needing some sort of badass tactical turn-based strategy kind of thing you might want to take a look at hard west which is uh which is a really cool it's a really cool turn-based strategy game it's uh it's a weird west genre sort of thing you know where you've got it's set in the old west but there's all of this mysticism and supernatural so so far as i can tell brent is it not i i I watched this and honestly what i thought was XCOM in the old west yeah i mean that that's a that's a relatively fair evaluation at least as far as the combat goes i have no idea what it's got uh you know if there's any other kind of as as an example building base building or or rpg i know that there's a touch of rpg-ness to it they also talk about there being some exploration and, and a slight hint of adventure quality to it as well. But anyway, Hard West is uh, is a pretty it's a pretty interesting little title uh, coming from uh, Creative Forge Games. They had a successful Kickstarter last year, and it's due out sometime this fall on Linux, yep. Mac, and PC. So if you haven't seen Hard West yet, and you're looking to fill that uh, turn-based strategy itch. Assuming that they don't delay too, which God knows it could happen, 
But uh, check out Hard West. There's a uh, there's a great there's a great uh, gameplay video that uh, we're going to link to, and you'll be able to uh, to check that out. See see the devs showing off Hard West in action. It's worth your time. Yeah, I have a feeling that fans of the XCOM series are going to be particularly intrigued by this game. Yep. Uh, so what else we got? So we got a couple things, Brent, left in the in the garage. The first is a couple of videos on Mad Max, as we alluded to, Brent, that comes out uh, this week, September 1st. Yeah. Uh, depending on when you're listening to this, um, you may be playing it already. Uh, a couple couple things we, li- we linked to an article first is about how Mad Max is 1080p on both the Xbox One and PS4, uh, which is almost sad that that's newsworthy, headline-worthy, but it is, mm. uh, and as well as that the map isn't finite. Uh, so they said that, uh, they didn't go as far as saying it's infinite, but they said you could drive until you get bored. There's no end to the map. Now, there may not be anything out there, but you could do it in theory. Uh, they didn't really say procedurally generated. There's stuff all the way out there, but there are no invisible barriers. Um, it, uh, also, Brent, uh, that we're linking to is another video called Mad Max Gameplay, Seven Things You Have to Do. Um, and this is what you were alluding to in the, uh, I believe, the wonderful opening in which you talked about me rubbing stuff lathering on my body. Yourself, lathering, lathering your naked in break flesh fluid. up in brake fluid. So I'm curious, Brent, so I don't know how much you've watched. I've been actually watching several videos of this and uh, of this game, and particularly I watched a Polygon put out like a 70-minute video of gameplay. Yeah. Um, and I keep going back and forth on this game. I, it's Avalanche Studios, so there's some very like Just Cause uh, 2 type of mechanics where you're pulling stuff down and you're grappling to people with the car, car grappling to people, I should say. The fighting looks somewhere between, you know, Shadow of Mordor and and uh, Batman looks just brutal. But at the same time, I get this weird vibe, This and, and I'm going to use it again, the ubification mm. uh, of this game. It, it, they, they show the map, and it looks like a map that that um, comes just straight out of... Um, Compton? When you look at the map, like Far Cry... Oh, yeah, no, straight no. out of Compton. It looks just like a Far right. Cry 4 map, and the, the UI of, like, finding your locations... I don't know. I'm really on the fence about this, depending on what I'm watching. If uh, uh, I just can't tell how I'm going to feel about this. And I was curious, Brent, if you're watching this, where you stand on this game. Are you still super excited for the game? Yeah, I'm, I'm still pretty excited for Mad Max. I, I really like, I, I like the open world exploration. I, I'm really, really curious to see how the combat feels. I love the, the kind of variation on a theme from the Arkham the Arkham Combat System, we talked a bit about that last week, but it looks very, very different in practice in these in these gameplay videos that we're seeing. It's not the fluid, constant movement, constant momentum, flow of combat that you saw in Batman and that you see to a, a lesser extent, In although there is, there is still a quality of that in Shadow of Mordor. This feels completely different and yet seems like it could be very satisfying. And I love the idea of having that world there to to explore. And one of the things in this specific video that they mentioned a couple of times and that I really, really agree with is environmental storytelling. They talked about how there's some fantastic environmental storytelling that goes on with some of these set pieces, some of these locations in Mad Max. And, and I just, I, I love sandboxes. And, and I understand that kind of works as a pun in this case, but I, I love sandboxes. I love having a world to go and explore and everything that they've talked about with the game systems within Mad Max, things like the combat, things like the, the cars and what you can do with the cars, the, the harpoon and all the different ways that that's being utilized. There's just so many qualities to this game that seem like they could make for a lot of fun. And I like open world games in general and Mad Max just has enough qualities to it that make it uh, a, a little bit, a little bit unique while also bringing in elements from other games that I already know that I like. And so I, I, I'm, I'm probably more likely to get it than not at this point. So let me ask I'd you this, hear, oh, well, Let me just put it this way. Yep. I would have to hear some really, really damning stuff on it to not pick it up right now. Like, I'd have to hear that it's fundamentally broken, that it's only two hours long, or, you know, some, I'd have to hear something really catastrophic to not get the game at this point. I'm pretty much set on getting it, barring anything like that. Let me ask you this. Does it sway you in any way, Brent Adams? So the game is uh, $59.99 on Steam on the PC. Okay. Uh, the minimum specs, I think your system meets. It's an uh, Intel Core i5. It says 650. Uh, I, I don't even know how I've old that must be. Three point, I'm guessing it's 4650, maybe 3.2 gigahertz. I'm not I don't really know. sure. I've got a 2500K. Yeah, I can't. 
I, I don't even know what that is, but the it's the uh, no because the the uh, the rec the recommended is i seven thirty seven seventy. But the game right now on Green Man Gaming, uh, and for those of you listening, unfortunately, the deal will be done is forty percent off, so thirty six dollars. Yeah, no, nah, I, I don't I don't care that much. I don't care that much to get it. I don't I don't know that I could run it on PC anyway. So. It, it, right. it's one of those I'd probably be more apt to get on console just because I'm not yep. sure my PC can run it. Well, there you go. So, so back and forth on this one, but, uh, but I definitely am interested. So Brent last up in the garage, yeah. uh, we have finally dude, huge cliffy B yep. announced the new title that he's been working on. Yeah. And, uh, it's, I don't know. It's an interesting mix of sort of what you'd expect and, and maybe not what you'd expect. I'm not sure, but, it is a uh, is it is it a, it's a four on four multiplayer shooter? Is it? I can't remember if it's five on five. I can't. I, I, was th- I honestly I was th- don't remember either. I was thinking it was four on four, but anyway, it, you know, it's a it's a competitive multiplayer shooter called Lawbreakers, and we've got some gameplay from it, and then we've got a, an interview at PAX Prime with uh, with Cliff Blazinski that you can check out, and just him kind of talking about some of the some of the thought that went into the game, some of the ideas. And the, I guess the wordplay, and I'm not entirely convinced that he hasn't been consulting with Daniel Kaiser on some of these things, but <laughs> Lawbreakers is a play on word, uh, play on words in the sense that uh, it is ultimately sort of a cops versus robbers set in a uh, hundred years in the future after the moon has shattered and it's, uh, it's messed with, with uh, Earth's gravity in pretty profound ways. And so we have not, a post-apocalyptic is not, quite the right description but certainly post catastrophic post cataclysmic earth environment that's well, yep, full that's of, a good way to say it of exotic technology and and things that are familiar and yet also very very different so anyway but uh, you've got these we're introduced in the trailer to the four the uh the four classes i guess and you can uh you can you can check out like what they're doing but it's got that low gravity you know kind of thing that that early Unreal and, and Quake and everything has had. And, I mean, it basically just looks to be, you know, four-on-four four multiplayer mayhem. I mean, that, that really is that really is the name of the game here. So this is not my kind of game. I, I mean, I typically don't go for multiplayer shooters. Usually it has to be something pretty unique or something that already has, like, a built-in draw with me, like a Star Wars Battlefront, as an example. But more often than not, I don't really go for these. Uh, but I, I know you, Lauren, certainly have played more than I have. What's your take on this? Is this anything that's got your attention? Uh, it, it has my attention. I mean, it, 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 you know, I think Blazinski, you know, he talks about Unreal Tournament, obviously, in the sort of low-grab environment. I think he probably was wise to see the success of Titanfall. I mean, you and I have talked about in previous games yeah. how important I think the sense of motion within a game is and how powerful a, really, a game that's really fun uh, in terms of the movement, like a Sunset Overdrive, like a Titanfall, uh, can be and how long that mechanic can last. Or Saints Row Four does it. Crackdown did it. Yeah. Um, and I, I think he's that's part of the train he's jumping on. And he's relating it to Unreal, which is, makes perfect sense. Um, but I, 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 my guess is, is something like a Titanfall didn't have um, uh, wasn't absent from his influences when he was looking at this game. Uh, so it does interest me. You know, one of the interesting things about this is it's a PC only game. Uh, well, right it is, now, he, he leaves the door open. <laughs> That it could eventually come to consoles, but they have no deal in place right now to do that, and they're focused on the PC. Correct. Uh, the other thing that I think is potentially interesting about this is it's, he's intending it to be free to play. Yeah. Uh, and he really is, you know, I mean, he says in this interview, he says, you know, free to play games t- typically have a stigma of sucking because when they first came out, they sucked. Yeah. Um, and they were paid to win, and mm-hmm. he doesn't believe in that, but he really wants to create a free to play experience. That sort of shadows shatters those expectations, and whatever you think about Cliff Lazinski uh, and his previous games, the fact is is he does have industry clout, uh, and he is he is a name in the industry. And for somebody uh, this big to be working on a primary sort of triple A title with the intentions of making it free to play, and with the intentions of redefining what free how free to play um, plays out, uh, I think is is has the potential to be something important. If he does it right and he and he does a good job and he can flip that model on its head, I think he might have something. I, um, I I agree. I mean he he certainly has. I mean he's got talent. He has a lot of passion in this arena. Uh, so I I have to agree with you. I I think that there's definitely potential there. I just don't know if it's anything I'm going to want to buy in on. 
Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I might get you in there because it's free to play. Uh, well, so, and that's, I mean, and that's, that's the great thing is that like it, 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 like it costs me nothing to find out. I mean, I can at least try it out. You and I can sit down and play it and figure out if it's fun or not. You know, and I, I mean, it's and, and and it's you know, Rocket League, which has sold over a million copies at this point, yeah. quote sold, um, <laughs> was a free to play was a free to play game from my perspective. It wasn't meant to be that, but it was a PS Plus game, right. um, and, and something I never would have gotten into. And I have since paid four bucks because i wanted to give them money and i will give them more money probably because i love the game so much so i think it's there's uh, also i don't know j- j- just a real quick anecdote there's also a, a funny moment during the interview where he waves at somebody off camera and goes hey there's Dave yeah. from rocket league <laughs> yes which i absolutely love <laughs> uh which is which is funny yeah, so no i mean i think up. i think it's interesting i do like uh multiplayer online games i liked i loved titanfall uh, obviously, I like Battlefield, and yeah. so I don't know. I'm I'm interested in this. I'm interested to uh, see where he goes with it. Yeah, I, I guess the the thing for me is that while while this style of game does not uh, does not always uh, ring my bell, I'm very very curious about him tackling the free to play thing head on and whether or not he can do anything unique there. I, I'm very very interested in that because I I certainly have a certain amount of trepidation. But I, I don't think I have the out and out hatred for free to play games that some people do. I, I've played a number of free to play games, uh, you know, both things like mobile devices, uh, Star Wars Commander, uh, you know, up to like Marvel Heroes on the PC, and you know, I, I I do I like the potential that those experiences offer if they're tuned well, and and I'm very very curious about what he's going to do there, and if he can in fact break the stigma because I mean he's bringing free to play to a PC audience who's probably uh, they're probably as jaded about the subject as anybody. So if he can do something really if he can do something you know really profound in that particular area with this game then you know that would be praiseworthy over and above whatever experience the game might offer. So I I wish him the best. I I'm curious how it's all going to play out uh, once Lawbreakers finally releases. Welcome back, and welcome to the clubhouse. We are going to pull up a chair and talk a little bit about Metal Gear Solid V, The Phantom Pain, and the interesting review process that that game has gone through. But first, we have the poll results from our conversation last week. Lauren, would you please do the honors? I would be happy to, Brent. So last week we were talking about uh, the video we watched from Extra Credits about new take on World War II games, and you posed a question to our listeners, and it was as follows. How interested are you in playing a new take on World War II games? You gave them four answers to choose from, Brent, and coming in at fourth place with just 6% of the vote was they don't need to change anything for me. I love the classic titles. So it sounds like very few people wanted to just keep things as they were. Yep. Coming in in third place with 13% of the vote, I feel like those games have run their course. Mm-hmm. Coming in in second place with 30% of the vote was the answer, I'm not remotely interested in another World War II game. <laughs> and winning the poll with 51% of the vote was the answer to the question, how interested are you in playing a new take on World War II games? The answer being very. I love the idea of infusing some modern game mechanics into that genre. So it looks like there would be an audience, Brent, if they actually were to infuse some new mechanics and, and maybe bring a modern sensibility up to it. However, um, there are some out there who just don't give a shit and would rather not play a World War II game again. Well, I, I mean, I can, I can understand that. I mean, you reach, you reach, a, certain, you reach a certain point, and you're like, you know, I've, just, I've played this game. I've played this game, I've played it, and then i played it some more, and I don't need to do it again. Uh, so I, I can understand their reticency, but, uh, or, or their reticence, but uh, I... I think I probably fall into into that uh, that number one category. I was very intrigued by some of the ideas that we talked about last week, and and while it's not a genre that I have overt interest in, if somebody were to do something like that, I, I have to say I would be I'd be interested to check it out. As would I. I think something that a lot of us agree we're looking forward to playing is Metal Gear Solid Five: The Phantom Pain, which we will be doing right about now ish, depending on when I get this thing edited and put up. But uh, the point is, you're probably playing it right now some of you and that's right screw mad max i'm buying this now <laughs> the uh the but the, the thing about it though is if uh if you're playing the game right now chances are that's because you've heard such good things about the game from the reviews that are out there uh got a 95 rating on metacritic right now 100 from ign 
uh, game trailers gave it a 93, even though they're, they're fucking dead to me. The Washington Post gave it an 80. Actually, that's no, not so great. Anyway, back to the, uh, back to the 90. <laughs> the on Washington Medicare. Post. That's what you're, <laughs> the lowest score is from the Washington Post, which is like, I, I, I'm waiting for the, the Wall Street Journal to give it a 79. You know, if it makes you feel any better, the Washington Post wasn't really all that into the Watergate story either for like a year. <laughs> so I'm just saying, like, they don't always have the best track record with, with these things. They come around eventually. Eventually they get there, but in the beginning. But not right out of the but gate. They're not quick on the update. That Metal Gear Solid 5, everybody except the fucking Washington Post, seems to think is a pretty goddamn good game. However, a listener sent us an article to a, a very, very cool write up by Dan Dawkins over at games radar and dan talks about the review process for metal gear solid 5 and it was a little strange so instead of just sending out review code or or retail copies of the game to reviewers konami set up boot camps and invited reviewers to come to their boot camps for a week where they would be allowed to play the game from nine to five during that week, they couldn't play outside the nine to five time zone. They, they they couldn't play unsupervised, and that meant they had a maximum of forty hours to play this game. And it's a game that Konami says takes between thirty and fifty hours to complete. In air quotes, and I put it in air quotes because, as Mister Dawkins talks about in this article, the idea of completing this game or, or reaching the ending is slightly complicated. But he didn't go into that. Uh, this article is dated August 23rd. He didn't go into it at the time because the NDA had not yet been lifted. So anyway, the point is that if you if you own this game right now, if you've pre-ordered it, if it's unlocking for you tonight at midnight or you're rushing out to get it or whatever, chances are you've been sold on the reviews that are out there. But the reviews were made under kind of a kind of a, a different process. And I, I don't. I don't know whether or not it really colored anybody's opinion, but I do know that almost no one had sufficient time to really complete the game. So that just leads down some interesting pathways uh, in terms of whether or not people's purchasing habits in this case have been unduly influenced by this review setup that Konami put in place. What do you think, Lauren? Do, do, do you think that Konami has, do you think that they've manipulated this process? To, to get themselves a really, really good review score without actually letting anybody finish the game to completion prior to launch? You know, I'm not sure, Brent. I mean, this this feels like something that you want to get upset about. Um, yep. and, and I think it's very odd. Uh, I don't understand why um, h- how the boot camp protects them from, uh, from, sp- from spoilers. Which ostensibly is why they did it. Yeah, right, and I, I don't, I don't quite get that because to me, either you trust your reviewers or you don't, and so I mean, I understand if you say choose not to, yeah. if there's certain reviewers, let's, and I'm, I'm going to pick Angry Joe not for any reason, but if there's, you know, say Angry Joe is someone you feel like might not be able to keep the secrets that you want, so you don't send Angry Joe a review copy or whatever, yeah. but, but uh, whoever they or, invited or, or to if this thing does burn you, then you know you blacklist them for all time. It's like okay, yeah, well you got us on I, this I mean, one, but you'll never get another review game from us. Well, and clearly nobody's going to want to review a Konami game after this because of what they've been doing to Kojima, so that's not going to be really much of a deterrent. That's a but, good point. But um, <laughs> I, I, I just don't understand. I mean, if, if people are playing 35 hours of your game, uh, ostensibly they'd be able to spoil your game for you. Uh, so To a large degree, I, yeah. I, I also don't understand why, you know, some of what... Some of what I've heard in the critiques of the game, I haven't read a ton of reviews. So this is the other thing. I've, o- I've only read a couple of reviews, but I'm surprised that I've not heard mention of this anywhere else. I didn't see it in the IGN review. I didn't see it in the game trailers review. Um, you know, I didn't see, I-, I didn't read the rest, but I haven't heard the mention outside of this being sent to us. Um, uh, I, you know, the complaints I have, not complaints, but... People, some people have taken issue with the story being. This, I know this is going to come as a shock to you, Brent, for a Metal Hold Gear on, game. Let me sit down. <laughs> being somewhat convoluted. <laughs> uh, now, the story being so apparently. Well, no kidding, uh, like, I heard Co- the story was kind of bare bones. Like I was, I heard that. Right. It, it, it's probably like sort of the least. It's like the it's like the least narrative Meaty part of the game. Of, oh of yes, any of them, or at least any Absolute, in a long time. By- by by far, I think. I mean, I think they really. But honestly, especially that suits compared me fine. I mean, that's music to my fucking ears. Absolutely, I th- and I think compared to MGS4, which had literally had thirty to forty minute cutscenes, yeah. 
Um, I, apparently, Kojima has gone completely the other direction here and has made very bare bones uh, narrative here, which is interesting. But so people are commenting on the narrative, but I have to, I, I can't assume they've all actually finished the story. Yeah. So how do you really appropriately comment on, I wish the narrative would have been more detailed or not, if you haven't had the narrative wrapped up for you? And I, I don't know. It's a very odd thing, Brent. Yeah. I, I do think that 35 hours... So remember, they got 40 hours of gameplay to do it, um, but that's not including any bathroom breaks, lunch breaks, or anything. So they're really maybe getting somewhere between 30 and 35 hours at best. Yep. Um and I think by the time you're 35 hours into a game, you have a pretty good idea of what your feelings are about the game and the quality of the game. I really do. So I don't think that the reviews are necessarily hindered by this process. I, I'm not, I just don't understand it. I don't understand why you would do that. And especially, you know, a game like this that's, that's uh, so richly developed, the open world is so huge and so much the narrative comes from uh, what's supposed to be discoverable elements. You want them to be searching for these cassette tapes and Intel. And cause that's, what's really telling your story mm. to confine the reviewers to a, to a specific experience. I mean, this is a game that you probably want to experience over a couple of weeks. You want to give people the space to, I mean, regular players are probably going to experience it over a couple of months. You know, you probably want to give the reviewers room to explore instead of feeling like they have to sort of power their way through it. And I, I think it would fundamentally change the experience. And again, I just don't understand why you would do it. I don't think, Brent, and, and tell me if you agree with this, because I'm curious to know, if, I, I don't think that they're hiding anything or protecting themselves by doing this and that they have somehow artificially inflated the scores by doing that. I don't see how that comes out of this process. It just doesn't make sense to me. I don't know. What do you think? I guess I kind of feel like... Um, I feel like the, well, let's take the Witcher three as an example. Okay. Neither you or I have finished the Witcher three. We've not completed the narrative for that game. I've got something like, uh, I guess I've got probably about 60 closing in on 60 hours in the Witcher three right now. Jesus. Really? Uh, it's something like that. Well, I think I was like, I was like 50, I was around 50 last week. And I've played more since. So, yeah, I mean, I've, I've got to be 60 or, or close to 60 at this point. Okay. So, anyway, close to 60 hours in The Witcher 3. Not completed it. I definitely feel like I could comment, like, I could sell the game to somebody at this point. I could tell somebody why the game is amazing and all of the, the things about it that I've experienced so far that are amazing and, and really, really great. And a lot of how the, the game system, certain game mechanics, the RPG aspects, upgrading alchemy, all that stuff. I could talk about those things and how great they are. And I could talk about how interesting the story has been so far. I could talk about the quality of like the secondary quests and how those are really interesting, self-contained stories and that kind of stuff. But I certainly don't feel like I'd be in a position to talk about the story of this game and how it has impacted me or, or, or you know, how cleverly it's done as compared to something like a Red Dead Redemption, where the true brilliance of that game really did not reveal itself until like the last 2% of the story was completed. Uh-huh. And I guess that I feel like, just being realistic about it, spending that much time with the game, you certainly are going to be able to get familiar enough with it to to talk competently about things that that the average gamer are really going to need to hear in, in making a, a, a purchasing decision. And I don't know. I, I mean, I, I'm just trying to decide if I'm trying to decide if, if, if this is really like a good or a bad thing, because I, I, I feel like in most cases, a review for a game is somebody, you know, getting a review copy and just playing through it at breakneck speed to finish it in time to write up the review you know, for, for whenever the NDA comes off or, you know, release day or whatever it is. And I often think about that process and say, I'm not really sure that that is the ideal condition under which to review this game. I'm not sure if just playing through the game at breakneck speed really is going to tell, and like hearing impressions from that style of play is going to tell me what I want to know about it. And 
So I, I, I tend to put, I mean, like I said, like I don't really read a lot of reviews. I tend to base my purchasing decisions on watching gameplay or recommendations from friends uh, who, who I, I feel know my tastes and, and make informed recommendations based on what they know I like uh, and that kind of thing. I, I don't tend to put a lot of stock in reviews. So I don't know. I guess for me, I kind of look at this process as being different, but I don't know that it's substantially disadvantaged over how reviews normally go down, which is playing the game at breakneck speed. Perhaps they didn't really complete it here, but I still feel like they're able to say enough that it helps me make a decision. I mean, certainly some of the things that Dan Dawkins talks about in this Games Radar post, certainly some of the, the things that he talks about here were really, really interesting to me. And, and I love the idea that this game has complex, complex, complex gameplay systems and not a lot of story to, to sort of get in the way of it. It really is about you sort of creating a narrative, a Ludo narrative with your play. And he was talking about, it's going to be one of those games. I, I kind of liken to day Z where people are going to talk about, and then this happened to me. And then I did this and I went here and this happened. And all these unique experiences that came out of the, the, you know, the unique situation that got set up in the, the game moment that you were playing. So what do you think about, so I, I, I agree with you and, you know, it seems like we're on the same page with w- whether or not it, it impacted the quality or the, of the, authentic nature of the review. I'll be curious to hear what the listeners say. What do you think about the fact that, um, uh, about reviews being written and not revealing this? Um, and this, by the way, the story comes from Games Radar, so this is a legitimate news source. So I went back and just checked, like, the game trailers and IGN and, and uh, the Telegraph. None of them that I could find mentioned that this was the case. So I don't know if it wasn't the case for these, uh, for these outlets, but it was for Games Radar, or... How do you feel about the fact, Brent? Uh, how would how would you feel if you knew that IGN, Game Trailers, all these these places wrote these reviews and didn't didn't clearly state to their readers the situation under which they were writing it? I think they'd be better off being transparent about it and just telling everybody what happened. But at the same time, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I guess I guess I kind of feel like the way that they normally do it is also a little bit of a sausage factory in, in that you know you want the end product but don't necessarily want to see the process. Uh, but I, I don't know. Yeah, I, I, may, I may be in the minority on that. But I, I, I guess that I feel transparency as a general rule is always a better, better way to go. But I, I don't know. I, I don't feel like because they normally don't go into the details of like how the review is necessarily done, I understand where they may not feel obligated to do that here, although this is kind of a unique circumstance. Well, certainly. I mean, although there, there, I, I do think it's different, Brent, uh, with regard to what you're saying, to divulge that you didn't actually finish the game, yeah. I, unless, and maybe this is my naivete, unless they don't. It's not uncommon for reviewers not to finish the game. I, not, I never even considered that possibility. I guess that I do just take it as a given that most of the time people, you know, people play the game to completion unless they state otherwise. And I, I don't know, but I mean, the thing, the thing about that is though. If they play the game to completion, I mean, let's just let's just take another open world game like uh, Grand Theft Auto V as an example. Um, how many play the the main story to completion, but don't finish all the secondary quests and stuff? I, I mean, I I think in most cases reviewers aren't going to hundred percent a game prior to writing a review. I think that they're going to play no, and I don't. the main story. They're going to maybe do a little smattering of secondary stuff. But I mean, you know, they're not finishing the game to a hundred percent. They're just kind of focusing on one aspect of the game to complete and leaving some other things undone. So, you know, how much how much of a hit do you take? Sort of saying, well, I'm focusing on some secondary stuff, but I'm not going to get that main story finished. You know, I, I mean, maybe it just kind of balances out in the end. Yeah, it's interesting. I'm not sure. So, I think we'll turn it over to the listeners, Brent. I'm curious to hear what people think if they feel like this is wrong or if they feel like maybe it's just a different way to do it but not necessarily uh, a, a bad thing and i'm curious to know if you feel like maybe the gaming outlets should have been clear as to whether or not they uh finished the story of the game or if they didn't or that sort of yeah. thing we'll turn it over to you guys and hear what you have to say all right 
right, guys, we are going to hit the road and talk about some of the games we're playing this week. And as promised, Lauren is here to talk a little bit about Until Dawn, which I understand based on your text messages that you have been enjoying quite a bit. Uh, yes, Brett, and not only no pun intended here, by the way, but I, I'm ready to go ahead and do a postmortem if you uh, are. Ha, 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 ha. Yeah, let's go ahead and do the postmortem. I skipped this no, game. Over to you, Lauren. I, I, I literally am. I finished the game okay. already. Okay, well, but now finished in air quotes because there's, well, there's yes. eight million possible endings or whatever. And I, yes, that is true. And Brett, I'm so excited to talk about this right, game. Well, well, so I just lay it on me. I want to hear it. So my wife and I t- together played this game. We downloaded it. Uh, I, I uh, downloaded it the day it came out. We played it every night this week except for the one night we had concert tickets. We literally five five out of the last six nights have played this game, and we have had so much fun playing it, Brent. Yeah. It is a wonderfully, wonderfully done game. And I will tell you, uh, I'll bury the lead here and tell you guys, you listeners, if this is a game you are interested in, if you understand the nature of how the game works, uh, and it's a genre in which you are interested, do not hesitate to buy it. It is one of the best horror games I've ever played. Uh, it's one of the best horror experiences I've had. Um, and it is uh, one of the best sort of... I, I wish there was a, a way to... I, I, how would you describe these games, Brent? These sort of Heavy Rain, um, Beyond Two Souls uh, kind of games. I, I don't want to call... I, I, I don't know what to call them. Adventure games that they're not yeah, like... I mean- I hate to to me they're kind of adventure adventure style games or you know like narrative driven adventure games. Yeah, with sort of alternative types of controls. Yeah. Um I, I think that so so this game, this is a a, a um homage to uh B movies, horror movies. The I Know What You Did Last Summer, The Cabin in the Woods, the Friday the thirteenth, Wes Craven, rest his soul, he passed away this week. Those kind of uh those kind of movies. And this uh, the the this game does a wonderful job of representing that genre. It is exactly everything you would expect it to be, Brent. Which is, uh, I think, everything that annoys you. Um, <laughs> which is the sort of somewhat shallow surface main characters. There's eight characters. Uh, you go to uh, um, uh, you go back to a cabin at which there was a tragic accident a year before. Uh, and the eight of you are returning to this cabin, things go awry, and your goal is to keep as many people alive as you can until the morning. And you can go, uh, this game finishes in many different ways. You could, you can live through the night with all, you can keep all eight characters alive mm-hmm. until dawn, uh, or you could lose every one of them and have nobody alive at dawn when it breaks. Um, so one of the, so the big draws in this game, Brent, are the, uh, the type of game that it is, the B, B movie, uh, or, or excuse me, the genre, the sort of horror game, B movie horror. Uh, the some of the draw is the narrative. Uh, some of the draw is the gameplay. I said it's kind of like Heavy Rain. Ask it's a lot of. Um, uh, I hate to say quick time events, but they kind of are button pressing it with prompts. Some of it is they use a really interesting mechanic where something scary is going on, and they take the PS4 light uh, and they put it inside of almost like playing the game Operation. It's inside of. Uh, a, a line and they tell you not to move and you have to hold the controller deadly still and if you move that blue light out of if you touch the sides of the lines you uh, it's a fail and it's really well utilized cool in this idea. game uh, and then another big draw here is the narrative design and what they're calling the butterfly effect which is the idea that there are multiple multiple choices throughout the game that lead to other choices that can take you in any number of different directions and i have to say brent uh this game has done that choice mechanic uh, better than any other game I've ever played. Um, it's really incredible. And, and I'm truly, my wife and I, as soon as it was over, were ready to start playing the game again to see what would have happened if we did this. We ended up, I'll just tell you, at the end of the game with four people alive. Mm. Um, and we were pretty proud of that. From what I've been reading, that's not a bad, uh, a bad first go around. Yeah. Um, it's really well done, Brent. The things that are great about this game, it's shockingly beautiful. Um, the um, the um, place that it lives in the genre, so it references many movies like Saw, like Cabin in the Woods, like Friday the 13th. Um, its relationship to that genre couldn't be more spot on. Mm-hmm. Um, the pacing in this game, and I talk a lot about pacing, the pacing in this game, for the most part, is fantastic. We played, I'm guessing between, I don't know, but between 10 and 13 hours, and there was maybe only 20 minutes um, 15, 10 minutes here and there where I felt like the pacing suffered. But other than that, for 
10 and a half of, of the hours that I played, the pacing was just phenomenal. They sw- the way they switch between characters and switch between the types of fears they're playing on. So sometimes it's a fear of being alone. Sometimes it's a fear of uh, the supernatural. Sometimes it's a fear of like an axe-wielding serial killer. Mm. They really play on all these different fears, and they just do a fantastic job of switching, of, of keeping the pacing where it should be, switching between characters, so you have multiple locations and sort of multiple stories going on together, uh, of switching between the types of fears they're playing on, and then also of the pacing between the sort of lulls in fear and the build-up and then the scary moments and then the denouement and back, and it just it's just really, really well done. And uh, the use of the controls during the frightening uh, times in the game is 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 spot on. It could not be better. Um, I like hearing that. I, I I love just some of the just some of the innovations that you're talking about that they they've implemented uh, in this game. It's really wonderful. So there's there's a few things about the game that I didn't like, but they are very small and few and far between. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't like. There is a shooting mechanic in the game, kind of like uh, uh, the Walking Dead, where. Um, you know, it, the game will stop, a, uh, a target will appear on the screen, and you all you have to do is move your reticle up to it and over to it and then pull the trigger, but they don't offer inverted controls. E. And I play exclusively with inverted camera I controls, and I actually lost one of the characters because I couldn't get the reticle. I sent it in the wrong direction mm-hmm. because it doesn't give me the option of inverted controls. And so it was only once or twice that it was a problem, but it was a problem for me, and that was annoying. Um I the two other things that sort of kind of you know iffy on were when you make a decision that branches off, it sort of uh, shoots this little sort of butterfly icons out of the corner of the screen, and I'm not sure why that's there. I almost kind of don't want to know when that happens. Yeah, I, I feel um, the same way. I think so. I wish I would have had an option to turn that off. Um, and then on top of that, there's many wonderful things in the game, including as you play through, you unlock, I think it's up to like 10 videos of behind the scenes footage. There's some wonderful mechanics in the game. Um, uh, one of the things that they offer in the menu is they show you sort of, there's, I don't know what it is, 25 or 30 butterflies. And in each butterfly, there's a series of choices that you might have made that led you down a pathway. And so you can go back and look at, um, so you made this choice, then this happened. Then you made this choice, then this happened. Then you made this choice, and this happened. And then you made this choice, and this happened. Mm -hmm. And I liked that. I liked that. um, I I liked in a way that that they let you do that, but I almost wish it wasn't there. Because we started looking, and after about the first three or four times we did that, my wife and I just said, I don't want to look at that. I don't want to know how my decisions change the story. So when I go back to play it again, it's as black and white as... Oh, don't make the decision to let Johnny walk down the, the pathway yeah, I, or whatever. I, I could I could definitely see wanting to do that at the completion of the game. You, you know, like finishing the game, going back and looking. It's like, oh, this, this, this. I can definitely get that, but at the same time, I, I can understand wanting to avoid that. I, yeah, I, I can, and it's I can weird see it because, both ways because it seems like one of those games that you do want to play through a few times before uh, and, and just see the different ways that it can go and. Again, like if you kind of see too much of what's going on behind the scenes, maybe maybe it doesn't seem quite as special. Right, and I would I would love to do that. So so what they do is they give you an option once you finish the game. You can either now go back and pick out chapters uh, if you want, or you can start a new game. If you start a new game, it overwrites everything, and all your collectibles are gone and everything. And throughout the game, you're collecting clues mm-hmm. as to the mystery three big mysteries that are in the game, as well as these totems that when you look at them, they they foretell someone's death or. Uh, a fortunate incident and it kind of guides you like oh if i see that it's a quick little two second snippet of video you're like if i see that maybe i should choose this or but it's really hard to read what's going on and so it's it's very it's a very interesting mechanic there's five different kinds of totems there's death which is if you pick it up and and you see the death one and it's your death it files it under death your being the character you're controlling at the time you control all eight characters at some point um, there's danger, which is if you pick up something and see somebody else, uh, see a little video clip of somebody else getting hurt, that's a danger totem. Uh, if you pick up one that is maybe a good choice, that's a fortune totem. Uh, and then there's, I can't remember what the other two off the top of my head, but there's two other totem categories. And each one gives you like a little two second video that just gives you maybe some insight into something, but you're not sure what it is exactly. Right. 
And so it's super interesting. So if you start a new game, it erases all of those that you have collected. Like, uh, alternatively, you can just choose episodes, chapters, and, and start from the first episode and play through the game again, and you'll keep all of your collectibles. You're just playing game and making a different choice or whatever. So, but if you do that, uh, it also overwrites, uh, if you get all the way through the game, it will overwrite your decisions. And so what I would love to see is the ability to save my first playthrough, including my butterfly choices, start a new playthrough, and save that playthrough, including my butterfly choices. Yeah. So I can go back after playing it two or three times and look at all of my butterfly choices. Um, yeah. So, again, it's a minor thing. I could choose not to look at them. It's a minor thing. Um, a- another thing that it does wonderfully, Brent, if you have a PlayStation 4 camera and you have to turn this feature on, is at about uh, seven or eight places in the game, it will videotape you during the really scary moment. So it tapes you screaming. Ah, yeah. And it's absolutely hysterical to watch back. That's cool. Um, the flip side of that is when you watch it back, it replays the game clip over your clip of you screaming, and they don't decrease the volume of the game clip, so it's almost impossible to hear your own scream. Eh. But it's funny to watch. Good so idea. Um, Poorly executed. Uh, just a little bit. So those, are, th- those literally are the nitpicky things I have about it. Beyond that, the controls were wonderful. The atmosphere was fantastic. The pacing was wonderful. I genuinely... This is one of the better games I have played all year, Brent. It really... Is it just a fantastic uh, genre game? That's cool. I I like so many things about it, it, it outside of the fundamental thing that it is, which is a, a fucking cabin in the woods slasher movie. And right, which is <laughs> which is one of the best things about you know, it. Um, I don't know. Like I was just sitting here thinking, like like if only they would do some variation of a theme on this game. Just like I mean. Just as an example, like my pie in the sky is like, hey, uh, you know, we, we made like fucking John Carpenter's The Thing and it plays like Until Dawn where, you know, you, you're like playing through this, this, uh, this, you know, two day period of time or whatever at, uh, at Outpost 31 and uh, you don't know who's the thing and you got to make all these decisions and figure out, you know, like who you're going to trust, who you're not going to trust, uh, you know, what actions you're going to take and 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 you know maybe some of you survive and maybe some of you don't like if it was like a horror movie that i really liked i would love to play a, a right. game that 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 uh that just you know mucked in the sandbox like that but it, it it's very very cool to to hear your your thoughts on that and some of the some of the the innovative gameplay things that they are doing sound really really intriguing and and it sounds like overall what they've attempted to do with this has been successful it, it's been. I, I. It was. It was more successful than I could have imagined, Brent. And it was. I will tell you, it was tons of fun to play it with the wife. She basically. I drove, and and I saw other listeners on the on the site saying the same thing. I drove, and she made most of the decisions. Right. And uh, it was much like our marriage, actually. <laughs> but uh, uh, it was. It was. Uh, it was a fantastic experience. And every night, I would come home looking forward to playing it. Um, and it just. It just was just su- supremely, supremely well done. Cool. Very cool. Yes, indeed. All right. So uh, you have a couple of games. Of course, The Witcher 3 you already alluded yeah, to. Yeah, I'm playing The Witcher 3 still. Uh, let's see. I'm level 18 now. I am... I'm still in uh, in, in Vel- well, you know, Velen and Novigrad. I'm, I'm, I'm in that region of the world. I've not gone back to Skellige yet. Um, I'm trying to just think if there's any major milestones that would be worth talking about. I suppose one thing that I'll say, and I'm really trying to kind of save stuff because I'm pretty committed at this point to doing a post-mortem on this game because there's just so much here to talk about. We were talking, obviously, a lot about Gwent last week. I have now put together three out of the possible four Gwent decks. I have uh, I have decks for Skiotial, uh, Northern Realms, obviously, and then uh, the Nilfgaardian Empire as well. I've mostly played with uh, with Northern Realms and, Nif- and Nilfgaardian Empire. My Skiotial deck is not is not as strong as uh, those two. I think I think Nilfgaardian is my strongest. I think I've got like 138, 139 total unit strength in that. And then, did you see by the way that CG Project Red teased some sort of Gwent announcement? No, I didn't. When did this happen? Yes, uh, in the last day or two, they teased it. They didn't just a small teaser, but it's a teaser nonetheless. Oh man, now I'm getting excited. Um, <laughs> so anyway, I, I've I've been playing the bejesus out of Gwent and. And actually, you know, I totally forgotten because I, I've done so much Gwent stuff, but I have not yet gone 
to that high stakes. Uh, I've not d- yet done the high stakes Gwent thing in Novigrad, so I still have that to look forward to. Although I was really hoping, I mean, like I can do it at this point. I've got all the cards I need to do it, uh, but I was really hoping to put together all four decks before I did, and just you know, and just get some experience playing them. But Gwent has Gwent has proven to be a an amazing, amazing little subset of this game, and it's. It's an amazing subset of a game that is amazing in almost every way. I, I just got done playing a, a mission that really, really hit me hard. I, I mean, it, not not so much in terms of like the emotional stuff that was going on, although that was there, but the the layers of what was happening, the just the ingenuity and cleverness of the, of the mission, its uniqueness within the story, and ultimately what was kind of being said with it. I, I kind of pushed away from the desk when it was over, and I said, "That's amazing! Like that's really, really amazing." It's it's on the order of you know the end game stuff we talked about in Red Dead Redemption, where they they kind of break the fourth wall and do something like really profound. It's it's playing in that arena, and this isn't even the end game content, so um, it, it's pretty special. I'm I'm assuming I'm one, I'm trying to think of what you're talking about, but I'm assuming I haven't played it yet uh, because I haven't. Okay. Yeah, I- I'm trying to think. Well, okay, let's just see. Have you... Um, well, the-, the name of the mission is The Play's The Thing. Have you have no, you played that one yet? No, no. Okay. So, um, that one, that one's pretty impressive. That I, I-, I-, I find myself, uh, I find myself pretty, uh, pretty blown away by some of the, some of the layers of things going on in that, that mission sequence. So, anyway... Still playing The Witcher 3, still planning to get to 100% completion. I've given up all I've given up all vestiges of optimism that I was just going to play through the main story and maybe come back and work on the other stuff in a new game plus mode. That shit ain't happening. I I'm I'm 100%ing this bitch. That's the only way. That's the only First time way, through. That's the only way this is going to happen. I'm So does that mean I just so can't you, allow you and I myself been... to not play every single part of this game? So, so this is so, and, and we can be transparent with our listeners, Brent, and they certainly can sound off on this. You and I have been talking about the desire to do a, a let's yep. play. I mean, a let's play, a, a post mortem, um, and also sort of juxtaposed against the fact that Phantom Pain is coming out, mm. which is a massive and massively important game, yep. um, and what what sort of what we were going to do about that, and when we were going to, you know, how we were going to handle that, and so. Now, now I'm thinking if you're going to 100% this game, I have a little time to play the Phantom Pain. <laughs> maybe, maybe. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I'm. I guess I'm. I, I'm. I'm trying to sort of. I'm trying to strike like some sort of balance in my day to day play of like I'll I'll do a little bit of a main story thing and then I'll do like a Witcher contract, a secondary quest, and and play some Gwent. Like I try to kind of keep it in balance. But I, like I did this, I did a play session. I guess last week, last Thursday or something, where Z laid down for a nap, and I knew I had about two and a half, maybe three hours, depending on when she got up. But I knew I had a little bit of time, and I just I got I hopped on Roach. I left out of the East Gate, uh, or one of the East Gates of Novigrad, and I just saw like I saw like a little a little village somewhere on the map I hadn't visited. And there were a bunch of question marks between me and that. I said, well, I'm just going to go up there and see what that's all about. And I just hit every question mark on the way. I went to the village. I did a secondary quest. I picked up, you know, contract off the notice board. I I just spent three hours doing nothing but just riding around and just finding things to get into, adventures and stuff to have. And it was so fun. I mean, it was incredibly rewarding, just as rewarding as playing through you know these missions and seeing these story things shake out and and all that, I mean that's that's the remarkable thing about the game is that I can do either one. I can spend two hours playing through main quest, or I can spend two hours just wandering around finding things to get into, and they both seem equally fun to me. It's remarkable, and and not to you know not to sort of harp on it, but literally you could spend two hours playing Gwent and and have just a, an amazing and time and have and have yes yeah that's exactly right. So anyway, uh, that's Witcher Three. I'm I'm still playing it. I'll I'll keep you updated. I want to finish the game. I want to do a post mortem on it. I I really want to. Uh, I I just want to kind of share the experiences that I've had playing this game with everybody because it's been it's been amazing so far and it's not over yet. All right, we we have committed to that. By the way, Brent and I have committed to each other to do this. Yeah. So. 
uh, who, who knows what it will be based on, you know, Brent has a life and a child and I obviously have a life as well. And, uh, so it may not be in the next week or two weeks. As a matter of fact, I'll tell you right now that it won't be, but, uh, uh I guarantee that. but we have committed to doing one and this won't turn into deus ex. I promise you guys. All right. Thank you, Lauren. Uh, so Laura Croft go, let's talk about that just a little bit. Yeah. You bought Laura Croft go. I'm so happy to hear that. I, I can't wait to hear how it is. So here's how it is. It's in some ways it is exactly what you'd expect it to be coming off of Hitman go and features most of the same gameplay mechanics, which is to say you move one space at a time. A lot of the, a lot of the gameplay mechanics are built around, you know, the enemy faces this way and you can't approach them from the front. So you got to come in from the side or the back. And so you have to maneuver around them, you know, like work within the level to kind of make that happen. Uh, different kind, different types of enemies will respond different ways. Like, you know, some will just stand there looking one direction. Some will actually spot you and follow you, that kind of stuff. So a, a lot of those things that, that you've got from Hitman Go are here. In addition to that, you've got, um, you've got puzzle solving. You've got a, a collectible system that works a little bit like Where's Waldo. And in that uh, there's these little like these little sort of clay pots uh, on screen that will be sometimes th- you'll see them very easily and sometimes you'll really have to look look out for them but there'll be these little these little clay pots on screen and you, you'll tap on one of those and it'll it'll have a collectible and and through each area of the map you'll have a number of gems you can be picking up like you know rubies or sapphires and then you'll also have a number of components of some artifact like. A uh, you know like 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 this golden statue of a double-headed serpent as an example, and you know you'll pick up one piece out of ten of that golden serpent in, in one of these pots, and then the other will be like, oh, you found ruby number five out of twenty, that kind of thing. So there's the collectible aspect, there's the puzzle solving, and then there's the uh, there there's just like the general. I I I don't know if I'd exactly call it uh, platforming, but Certainly traversal is is a thing in the game where, you know, just figuring out how you're going to get from point A to point B is is sometimes a little complicated. And that folds into the puzzle solving and then also sort of the enemies and, you know, their their kind of patrol patterns and things like that. Um, I can't decide if I like the game or not. That's I was I'm kind of waiting for for that. Your description has left it open. I. In some ways, and, and okay, like here's the thing: like I feel compelled to play it, and I do really enjoy the challenge of it. I, I enjoy the challenge of the puzzles and all that stuff. But just because I'm enjoying it, I can't decide if that means it's a good game or not. And there's something about it that I don't like. Um, the 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 whole thing to Hitman Go was taking. Uh, just the hitman sort of premise and turning it into a board game. That's what hitman go is. It's hitman, right. the board game. Uh, and the, 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 the graphics reflect that, you know, you've got little game pieces. The whole reason that you only move one space at a time is because it's a board game paradigm. And, and you've got a like fucking physical little H 47 going around, you know, doing this stuff. And it's brilliant. It's such an inspired idea. And so you come into Laura Croft Go, and now you're just playing a regular video game that has board game constraints, like only being able to move one space at a time, or only being able to kill a snake, even though you've got two handguns, by sneaking up on it from the side or from behind. So it doesn't read like a a, a board yeah, game. Yeah, and so that's the thing. It's like the logic of the game mechanics don't make as much sense outside of the context of it being a being a board, board game. game, right? Like now, it's just sort of like okay, we're going to take those those game mechanics and we're just going to plug them into something else that doesn't seem as doesn't seem as married to the idea as Hitman Go was. So. I love those game mechanics though. So I really enjoy I really enjoy playing the game, but there's something about it that feels kind of cynical to me. 
like, like insincere in a way. Uh, like they just, they're just like, oh yeah, you know, everybody loved that. Uh, everybody loved that Hitman Go. We'll just do another one. It's like, okay, so we're going to do the board game thing. Nah, fuck that board game thing. It's just going to be, you know, Laura's exploring a tomb. She got to find some keys. Got to get some artifacts. Like, well, but the, the game mechanics were kind of about, you know, being like a boy, get out of my office and make Laura Croft go, go, go. <laughs> like, that, like that's how it feels like the conversation went down. You know, it's just like, it feels like on some level, the, the, the decision to make this game the way that it is, uh, or whoever made the decision to make this game the way that it is in some way, almost didn't quite understand what Hitman go was, you know? And so I, I, I find myself really torn between loving the gameplay and not being completely engaged by sort of the concept of the game, I guess, but it, it, it is challenging and it is fun. And, and if you enjoy that Hitman go style of gameplay, there's a lot here. And I, I like the collectible system. You can use it to unlock different outfits and things like that. They've iterated on the gameplay and introduced, introduced new, uh, n- new kinds of gameplay that are really, really fun uh, the various weapons and things like that that you can use uh, really factor nicely into the game. And I, I dig how puzzle... I mean, ultimately, Hitman Go was a puzzle game, and, and this is too, but with the traversal mechanics and things like that, they, they've just introduced new kinds of things. Like, you know, you can hit levers and and switches and things like that that will move platforms and things around within the environment that just make it more interesting. And I understand that well, uh, well, I was going to say, well, I understand they can't do that in a board game paradigm, but why not? I mean, why couldn't it be, uh, you know, whereas Hitman Go was to board games, Laura Croft Go is to, like, a Tomb Raider adventure toy set, you know? And so, like, the paradigm is, it's like a physical, it's like a physical toy that you're playing with that has all these these features or, you know, whatever. Um, I don't know. There's just, there's something about it that I have not quite, uh, I've just not quite gotten over there's there's some quality to it that that is bothering me a little bit but the gameplay is a hundred percent solid challenging and very fun and very very well suited for the uh, for the mobile platform i've only played it on ipad i haven't tried it on my iphone so I, I don't know how well it would work on that smaller form factor but certainly on tablet it's a it's a winner uh, in terms of the gameplay <laughs> with the sort of like a last caveat yeah, thrown yeah. in there. <laughs> and I, I don't know. I mean, you know, maybe I'm overthinking it. Maybe people are just rolling their eyes and saying like, I don't get what there is to be upset about here. No, honestly, I mean, I kind of got that sense of it when I was looking at it, Brent, I didn't pick it up for that reason. I loved hit yeah. and and something felt different about this in a way that I didn't feel wholly positive to me. And so I, 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 I was curious to hear if you had gotten it or to see uh, what other people's personal take on it was. And so uh, it, it doesn't come as a surprise to me. All right. So anyway, but that's it for I me. I guess I'm going to let this one go. Oh, come on. Don't do that to me, man. I had I had fucking seven years of that, man. Just for old time's sake? Oh, man. I don't need that. Anyway, um, <laughs> so let's go ahead and ride into the sunset. Lauren, what's, uh, what's your shout-out going to be this week? Yeah, so my shout-out this week is to the announcement that uh, Valve and HTC Vive, the VR headset coming from that partnership between those two companies, uh, has given us a little bit more information about its launch in 2015. You know, the Oculus Rift is supposed to be coming out in Q1 of 2016, as is theoretically the Morpheus. And the big deal was that HTC and Vive, or HTC and Valve, were going to put out the Vive uh, this holiday season. Well, it turns out now that we've gotten a little clarity on that, and they will be doing a limited launch no, in 2015. Really? I know this comes as a shock. Yes, I would never have never guessed. Never would have guessed. Uh, I know, and, and uh, while they're technically keeping their promise uh, to release a headset, it seems like most consumers won't be able to get their hands on it, to quote the article, uh, until early next year. So uh, they have said that they will offer the first commercial Vive units via a limited quality quantity of community and developer systems with larger quantities shipping in calendar Q1 2016. The specific wording... Um, uh, the article says is a bit confusing. They haven't really said exactly what they're going to be shipping and to whom will they be, will be getting them. But I think it comes as no surprise to anybody uh, that we're not getting the wide release of the Vive uh, in holiday this year. But it looks like Q1 2016 is shaping up to be the moment that the world changes. Yep. The, the, the day that VR happens. So That's exactly right. All right. Well, best of luck to them. We'll, we'll, see, how it, uh, we'll see how it plays out. 
Indeed. Uh, Brent, you have one about a game I know you're excited about. Yeah, we're talking about a little bit of Hitman. Uh, there's a 15-minute playthrough of the Showstopper mission uh, for for the new Hitman game, and I'm linking to that footage. Uh, there's some developer commentary just talking about the philosophy of this new Hitman game and how it's all going to work, some of the new game systems that are in place, various things that are, they are bringing in from Absolution. And, uh, and I found it fascinating. I'm very, very excited about Hitman. I love the idea of what they are talking about. Again, they are giving you essentially in this case, like they're giving you a mission and that mission is a, is a small sandbox. That, that mission is, is a small open world. In this case, uh, we're seeing a, a mansion and the surrounding, the surrounding grounds. You got to get the head honcho of this, uh, this fashion organization that also happens to be the head of a spy organization. So anyway, they just show you like all these different all these different things that are built in, different ways of of entering the facility, different ways of solving problems, of getting access to areas that you shouldn't have access to, and ultimately taking down your target. I, I love the I love the sandbox aspect of it. I love the here's the tools, go figure out what strategy you want to employ. They, they talk a little bit about how the the various items and weapons accessories that you bring into the level will really kind of dictate your play style. So if, if you want to really go in guns blazing, you know, your loadout's going to reflect that. If, you, if you're going for a more stealth approach, uh, you know, you might be taking in lock picks and poison instead of guns and knives. So I'm very, very excited about the new Hitman. I, I really like in concept everything they're talking about. I think ultimately it's just going to come down to how compelling the experience is and just what they had said earlier about you know the kind of ongoing aspect like like the idea of like new content new things happening with the game over the course of a year uh after after it comes out i'm very very interested in in all of those facets of it so this is one i'm keeping my eye on and if you are interested as well then i'd suggest checking out this uh, 15 minute gameplay demo all right, Brent. And this week we have a ride along as usual. We had some great suggestions in the ride along category. This week we picked something from a listener, Soul Nibbler. Soul Nibbler, who wanted to talk about a game that he was excited about. And it's a game, Brent, that actually is out now on Steam and uh, GOG. It is a PC game called uh, Stasis. Stasis. Yeah. Excuse me. <laughs> I tripped over that. PC game called Stasis. So Soul Nibbler writes I want to guide your attention to a neat little sci fi horror point and click game called Stasis. It's made by just a handful of people, and it's got tremendous production value. There was an early alpha demo some years ago that I played, and I can tell you its atmosphere is too thick to cut even with a plasma saw. Imagine Dead Space with more puzzle solving and less action. Here's the brand new gameplay trailer, and he links to the gameplay trailer, which we're going to provide here for you. And Brent, I was completely unaware of this game, and and, uh, one of the reasons that we decided to put this on the docket, I looked at this, uh, I, I took a look at this video, and I was blown away. By the Same quality here. of this game, Same it looks here. it looks phenomenal. It's on sale uh, through September seventh on Steam for nineteen ninety nine. Its regular retail price will be twenty four ninety nine. And uh, I love point and click adventure games, Brent. I loved Siberia uh, and games along those lines. And um, this is a really interesting sort of isometric uh, point and click it point and click adventure game, essentially with a very dark atmospheric sci fi feel. And yeah. um, they describe it you know, as a point and click sci fi horror game. This is this is in the running up there with me now for Metal Gear Solid and Mad Max tonight. So I, don't, I, I can't do all of them, but this is definitely up there. This is a really interesting looking game, and it looks phenomenal. We wanted to give a shout out to the game, and thank you, Soul Nibbler, for pointing this out to us. Absolutely, uh, we think everybody should check it out. I, I agree. I, I was really blown away. I, I thought it looked fantastic. I love point and click games in general, and this one looks like it's doing some really, really fascinating and unique things within uh, that that genre. Indeed. All right, Brandon, with that, I think we've reached the end of the show. As usual, we want to hear what the listeners have to say about everything we talked about tonight, whether it was Stasis, uh, Hitman, the new mission playthrough that offers 15 minutes of new footage, the Vive headset, and the uh, revelation that not everybody's going to get their hands on one this this holiday season. Lara Croft Go Witcher 3 Until Dawn. Uh, Metal Gear Solid 5, the Phantom Pain review process, and what your thoughts are on that. And, of course, up in the garage, we talked about the announcement of Lawbreakers, uh, Mad Max, and the seven things that you have to do, Hard West, XCOM 2 being delayed, and the 
announcement of Deus Ex Mankind Divided's launch date and their 52 different kinds of pre-order scenarios, as well as Uncharted 4 and their launch date of March 18th and their 52 different pre-order scenarios. We want to hear your thoughts on everything that we talked about and anything else in gaming as usual. He is Brent Adams. I am Lauren Baumgarten. And remember, you don't stop playing because you get old. You get old because you stop playing. 